Claire is the research director for McCrindle Research and has been our partner in every study and I have to say is a remarkable researcher. She is also a um, social commentator. You'll have seen her regularly on TV and what have you. She's a very enthusiastic researcher and done some great work. So if I can invite Claire Madden. Thank you. Thank you. It was an amazing project we got to do to really find out what people are looking for when it comes to retirement uh, villages and the communication in helping them make that decision. But before we unpack that, it would just take a little uh, zoom out to look at what the landscape is, what the demographic reality is of this, uh, this sector and this age group in um, who, who are your potential customers in the years ahead. So as you know, Australia is growing. We're growing at both ends. We've got a baby boom going on at the moment with over 310,000 births every single year. We're also growing at the other end as well with people living longer than ever before. And we've got that baby boom generation who have hit at the upper end hit retirement age and are going to be coming um, strong, strongly through that area. So if we look at what's happening. Australia is growing at 1.6% per annum at the moment. That's about the equivalent of one new Canberra every single year. Now I don't know if we've got any Canberrians in the room. Not sure um, if we want one new Canberra every year but just kidding I'm sure we do. Um, but that's the equivalent of our growth at the moment and the world is growing at 1.0%. So we're growing at a faster rate than the world. And the, the average OECD nation is growing at 0.6%. So we're growing almost three times as fast as the OECD average. So if we look at what's happened in Australia uh, since 1966, we've doubled both our national and our global population in that period of time. The world has gone from 3.5 to 7 billion and we are now uh, at 20, almost 24 million. We'll hit that later in the year. How are we growing? We're growing by 40% by natural increase and 60% by net overseas migration. But we're also ageing. And this is our population pyramid if we go back to 1985. And you can see why it was a pyramid. There were more younger people than older people, so it makes that nice pyramid shape. If we look at what we look like today, it's this. So we're starting to become more of a population, I don't know, well, uh, square or rectangle there than, than a pyramid. So you can see we've got our baby boomers uh, just there where it uh, spikes out there. That's the start of the baby boom generation who are hitting that retirement age. And you can see that the growth and that aging isn't going to slow down. It's not like we just have uh, have that for a few years and then it's going to uh, slow down. You can see it's going to continue. So as we project what do we look like in a couple of decades time in 2045 we're going to look like this. And for the first time in Australia's history, we're going to have more over 60s than we do under 18s. So we're really starting to have an inverted population pyramid by the time we reach 2045. Now, whilst Australia is growing at a rapid rate, our over 65s are growing at even a faster rate. So in 1984, we had 15.6 million Australians and 1.58 million of them were over 65. Today, we've got about 3.45 million aged over 65. If we go ahead to 2044, about one in five Australians are going to be aged over 65 and our Gen Xers will be in that age group. It's scary to think that we're going to be the ones aging in these age groups but Gen X are really going to be in that over 65 age group by then and one in five Australians. We're going to more than double the number of over 65s that we've currently got. But if that's not fast enough, our over 85s are growing at an even faster growth curve than that. In 1984, we had 120,000 people aged over 85 in Australia. Today, we've got four times as many as we did then. By 2024, we'll have five times as many. And as we go to 2044, we're gonna have 14 times as many people aged over 85. So you've got your work cut out for you for, for many years ahead with 1.2 million more people aged over 85 in the next 30 years. Our life expectancy is also increasing. The latest intergenerational report that came out a couple of weeks ago shows that males' life expectancy at the moment is 91.5 and is expected to increase to 95.1 by 2055. Females are expected to go from 93.6 to 96.6 by that stage as well. So we're living far later. 
the, the impact on the population at the moment for every couple of retirement age, you've got 15, oh, oh, sorry, back in 1975, you had 15 people of working age, so age 15 to 64 in that bracket for every couple of retirement age. If we look at what it is today, it's nine. So you can see there's that decrease. And as we fast forward to 2055, there'll be about five people in the workforce or of that age for every couple of retirement age. So there's a massive ratio shift going on there as well. Importantly, what does this mean for the Queen? Well, this is, when she ascended the throne in 1952, she had to write 40 postcards to those Australians turning 100. Okay, so, you know, less than one a week, quite manageable. Today, she's having to write 2,643, but as we get to 2024, that will be 4,885, and I really do hope that she gets Prince Charles and, and William and, and maybe even Prince George onto it, because she's going to be having to write 18,567 postcards by 2044. So you can see the impact of our ageing. So knowing that this is the potential of your market, knowing that, you, uh, that the retirement sector has a huge growth potential, what does this mean? Well, the research was conducted because uh, of this villages.com.au site. There are over 20,000 searches a week, yet only 340 purchases of a village uh, retirement unit every single week. So that's about 2%. It's in an industry where their net promoter score is incredibly high. We do this McCrindle Baines Villages Census every few years and we've found that the, the sector has a very high rating. People uh, do give it a good score once they've experienced the uh, sector of 25. Just to put that in perspective, the number one telco company gets a min minus 14 on the NPS. The number one supermarket gets a 10. Number one airline gets a 15. The village sector gets a 25. So it's a very strong score. Uh, village sale prices not rising with house prices is another reason to look at this. So the hypothesis is that village sector can identify its unique value proposition and communicate it clearly and powerfully. So that's what, why we were conducting this research. How we did it was six focus groups with participants aged 69 to 81, so about 48 people. It built on the research from 2008, 2011 and the 2013-2014 study McCrindle and Baines have done together where we've got a huge amount of quantitative data as well as qualitative data about the retirement village sector. But we really wanted to understand when it comes to communication and uh, how people uh, perceive the industry. So the, the people in the focus groups were asked to define retirement. Many said, well, the word needs to be thrown out because we don't see it as retirement. We see it as re-engagement. We see it as we're busier than ever. And so there's, there's definitely a shift there. They were asked to talk about their perceptions of retirement villages, their attitudinal position towards retirement villages, their future accommodation plans, and were presented with a whole range of marketing materials. These materials that we tested were from print, radio, TV, video, outdoor, point of sale uh, materials, brochures and different concepts. We tested it across not-for-profit and private operators and every two focus groups we then tweaked the materials based off the feedback on some of the ads. We tweaked some of the ads to then see if we were able to get more of an accurate ad that they were really giving a thumbs up to. So there was a range of sort of materials that we tested to, to really see what hit the mark. So there, there were ones that more focused on the interior in apartments. There were ones that were focusing on the lifestyle, ones that had a lot of detail and maps and ads. We um, created a retirement village ads with you know, different detail, maps, all of that to just see what people were responding to. We uh, had the participants watch videos uh, across a number of websites and respond to the different impacts um, and the effects of those websites and what they would look at, look at when they went to a site, what they liked, what they didn't like. And they are incredibly informed consumers. And that is the first thing that we found. They are informed consumers. Here's, um, they give, they, this, this group of 69 to 81 year olds have given significant thought to their future. They have the undeniably discussed this, uh, the next stage of their, their planning and their future and their accommodation needs. They are well informed, mostly have uh, explored retirement villaging, village living to some degree and uh, have discussed it with their friends and their partners. This is some of the quotes that just um, came from the focus groups when we looked at some of the ads and so forth. Someone said, none of them grabbed me. I guess what I'd be looking for was an ad that contained more information in covering all the things we've talked about. Price, location, convenience to transport, shopping, medical support, all of those things we access on a day-to-day. -day. 
None of them talk about transport and convenience. That was the issue in my, my in-laws had. There was a shuttle bus, but you had to keep to the bus timetable. So they're informed and they're looking for information in the, in the communication that is really going to uh, provide detailed information about what it's going to be like. They're also very tech savvy. So three quarters of them describe themselves as living on the internet, regular users of the internet. This person said, well, stage one would be checking out the website, stage two, a Google search, stage three, if I'm interested enough in this particular one, I'll get a pack. They are tech savvy. And that was an incredible shift from the 2008 study to this study, how much they depend on websites, how well acquainted they were with doing Google searches and finding out a whole lot of information themselves before picking up the phone. The phone was a much later step and, and they were really judging it by websites and what they were able to get. So it's not just the young people, young generation, who are the just Google it generation, but you're seeing this uh, through every generation being tech savvy. If we just look at this technology timeline in the lifetime of a Gen Z who's born since 95, it's extraordinary to see this acceleration of the speed of change in this space. Google was only registered as a domain in 1997. You had the MP3 players first come in the market in 98. Uh, USB flash drives in the year 2000. We had Nokia 3310 come out that year. Anyone love the Nokia 3310? Anyone still using the Nokia 3310? <laughs> Fantastic, brilliant, two in the crowd. Uh, it's, it would still be working. That's the thing about that, that brick. And you can play Snake on it, and it was, it was advanced. Uh, Wikipedia, we've had MySpace, YouTube. Facebook opens to the public just in 2006, along with Twitter. You've got Dropbox, iPhones, WhatsApp, iPad, Instagram, Siri. You've got Facebook hitting a billion users six years after it's been launched. You've got GoPros, everything's being filmed these days, 3D printers, Google Glass. That's just in the snapshot of a Generation Z since 1995. Except it's not just your Generation Zs who are using all this technology. This was the first computer to come out really, the ENIAC computer in 1946. My nana was 16 years of age when this came, uh, came out and for her 84th birthday last year we gave her one of these. Now Pop has actually taken use of this far more than the nana but nana refers to it as the magic box. Yet Pop is on it every day uh, tracking when planes are landing. He's, he, I arrived at his house yesterday unannounced. He said, oh, I was just uh, looking at photos of you on Facebook. And so this, he's an 87-year-old who is now using the, the internet as a, as a main source. And this is what we found constantly in the groups, that they're very tech savvy. They're up with it. They've seen the transformation and they've adapted to that transformation and have been doing that for their whole lifetime. So they're tech savvy. Uh, the, Next thing is that the decision reluctance came through so strongly and uh, loudly. So they knew it was wise to plan for their future, yet nearly all of them were reluctant to, to do so. This was the kind of thing that they said over and over. Oh, it's something we're skirting around at the moment. I'm trying to put it off as long as I can. It's going to have to happen. Or there's a lot of stress attached to selling a house and buying another one. So it was kind of put in that too hard basket. One week, my husband wants to go, but the next week, he's changed his mind. My husband wants to downsize, but I'm happy to go to a retirement village. And so there was this reluctance to actually make that next decision. They thought about it, they knew it would be a good idea, but there, there was a reluctance in moving forward. Then there were the push factors. So they were reluctant, but then they knew that these things were pushing them out of their current situation. And so often it was uh, maintenance. So the house itself, it's a big house. I've even thought of locking off some rooms. It takes a while to clean or a push factor of health. That was another major push factor. Of course, if my health deteriorates, you need to rethink the whole thing. So things that would push them out of their current place. Then there were trigger events. So they could be a physical, emotional, or financial trigger that forced them to move to the next stage. A lot of people I know have chosen to move into retirement villages, not because of their age, but because they've lost their partner. So loss of a spouse was a trigger event. Health deterioration could be a trigger event. The emotional need to have community could be a, a trigger event as well. And so this was a concept that we tested that resonated strongly both with the men and the women. Whilst the women felt that the husbands were, were more likely to, to go first, it was also true for, for men needing community. So this one, I lost my wife, but I made new friends. That really resonated strongly as, an, as a factor they were looking for, the community. We're also dealing with who we call the options generation. 
So these, this was another big shift from the 2008 research where in 2008 they were looking for a lock and leaves lifestyle and that was quite attractive. Today they're very happy to manage that on their own. So they feel like they can sort out the lock and leave lifestyle by getting um, downsizing to a townhouse or a villa that's in some place that they feel like they can just do that. So some people said, we do talk about it. We, uh, we do look at real estate books all the time. We might move overseas. We've got many options. So they weren't thinking there's one linear pathway. You get to a certain age and then you move into a retirement village. No way was it the linear pathway to that thinking. That was one of maybe five options that people in these focus groups felt that they had. This person said, I didn't go ahead with a retirement village because I have a townhouse that provides security and I can still maintain my independence. I'm not ready for that phase. And so really they are the options generation. When it comes to looking at where they're going to live next, it's more like this. It's where you could go here, you could do that, or you could go overseas, you could move in with kids, you could um, downsize, you could get an, an apartment, whatever it might have been. Retirement villages were not the, the only uh, thing as an option and, it, and they weren't the one that was screaming the loudest either out of all their options. So they're informed, they're independent, they're well, um, they, they've got a lot of uh, options as far as they see it. This was another concept that we tested that also resonated really strongly. I didn't want others making decisions for me. It was that independence they wanted to maintain. And that was something they saw retirement villages might not um, provide for them. Sometimes they felt like if they moved there, they would lose that independence. Um, and, and that was, uh, a, I guess, a, a blocker for some. Marketing aware, they're very marketing aware. They're well informed, they're aware of their options. They're cynical of marketing that portrays unrealistic lifestyles. They're cynical of marketing that looked too good or the people looked too young, even though they did see themselves as a lot younger than they actually were. Then when you put up someone who looked far too young, they thought, no way, that is, um, that's unrealistic. So they wanted a balanced uh, picture to be presented. I didn't like the ring now. Hurry, why? What's the hurry? If they're selling so fast, they don't need to advertise it. So uh, they saw straight through that. Another person said, all those ads show seniors that look like they're 40 years old. They are not a reality. So again, they wanted that realistic picture. They also, in the marketing, didn't want uh, just something that looked great but didn't give them any information. And that came through a lot. So they wanted, um, they wanted a map. They instantly wanted a map. If there was no map, a lot would go, well, I don't know where it is. I'm not interested, or at least a suburb. Uh, if there was no price, they were instantly uninterested because they didn't know if it was relevant to them. When they're looking through their real estate magazines, which they're also doing because they're considering the downsize option, they will only look at ones that they know are in their price range. They don't want to find out all this other information about something not in their price range. So information like that was really important. And uh, one thing that came through so clearly was the influence of the intangibles. This came through over and over and over again. Really, when it comes to their decision to move into a retirement village, the tangibles are a given. The fact that it will be clean, that it will be a nice home for them to live in, that was sort of their base expectation. Well, that's a given, but that's not going to be the thing that makes them move into a retirement village. What would were the intangibles and what made them come alive and really start to be interested in retirement villages were these intangibles. So they wanted to, um, they wanted to know the impact of this. This person said, what you are looking for to start with is the intangibles. Depending on what is important to you, being able to cook for yourself, go to a restaurant, then there's the structure, then there's the finance. If you're living in something pokey and small, that will be unacceptable. And then the financials are important. We can live there and afford to, but most important are the intangibles. So what was the community? How was, how was it going to meet their emotional needs? What was, how was it going to meet their safety and security needs? We asked specifically, well, do you like that there's a call button in that ad? And they said, well, yes, we do, because that for them says that's uh, security and support, ticking that off. And so it was the emotional factors, it was the intangible factors that they were really looking for this to meet. So as this concept said, feeling safe, feeling good, and that mattered to them more than um, focusing on maybe the, the structural components. When it came to not-for-profit and private, it really made no difference to these. The majority of them did not um, saw no difference between the two types of operators. When it came to co-located care options, it wasn't a main priority, but some were happy to know that there, that was there as an option for later on down the track. 
Uh, so moving into a retirement village was seen as the big move and then anything that happened after that was sort of not, not seen as the major move. The major move was selling the house, packing up the house, moving into the retirement village. That was the thing. So in summary, uh, advanced retirees do not want to live in a retirement village. It's not like their number one thing they're, they're there um, thinking they're excited about at, at first until we tell them how good they are, of course. Um, and then events will escalate until they trigger a comprehensive need to find a solution, which might include retirement villages being on the shopping list if they understand what villages offer, which are the intangibles which we've talked about, the physical, emotional or financial support. Uh, these problem events lead them to a phase of planning. The seriousness of the problem dictates the speed and intensity of the planning. So it's those push factors and those trigger events that move them along the path of deciding to consider retirement village living. They're seeking a release from their problems. Their need is to have their problems taken away. They want to return to contentment that they had prior to those problems arriving in their world. And so in a summary, the picture that we saw coming through what worked in communication was um, the problem being identified, uh, which would lead to a planning stage. That planning stage would then lead them to considering a retirement village as one of the options. And again, if those intangibles and if it was seen as a place that would solve their problems, it was, it was more of a positive option. And then that retirement village ultimately leading to that contentment so that they don't have that, that problem as the main thing in their world again. So that's a quick summary of the research and Chris is going to follow on with a few more insights. Thank you. We actually presented ads and then on the feedback, we totally de deconstructed them, rebuilt the ads, presented them again, then totally deconstructed and presented them again. Uh, I'm just going to, just for a few minutes, show you uh, the ads that, uh, or examples of the ads that we resulted in. Uh, and I come from an advertising background where creativity is, uh, you know, what we all yearn for and win awards for and uh, respect of our peers and so on. And the reality is uh, this sector doesn't want creative ads, it just wants really good information. So this is the press ad that won the day at the end of the process. Not very sexy. Uh, not very sexy at all. It certainly won't win any awards, but it will sell retirement villages because it answers the, uh, the proposition that uh, Claire mentioned. So what have we got here? Um, if I can deconstruct it, we had a couple, a real couple who are real residents in a retirement village. So people said, I like seeing people who are the real people, not models. Um, and the message was, I'm, okay, uh, I'm now okay for 10 years. More importantly, Mary is now okay for 20 years. We bought into the village, Bill and Mary Jamison residents. So the message was, they, they knew that an event was coming up and they were planning and coming up with a solution for it. So real residents, uh, we put the prices in there. As Claire mentioned, these people wanted to know, uh, not priced from, they wanted to know from to. If you've just got price from, they immediately thought that you're being tricky. But if you put the whole price range, they, they, that appealed greatly. And as we've discussed before in these forums, uh, there is always somebody who wants to buy the most expensive, and usually the most expensive sell first because there are people who are happy to uh, be seen as buying the most expensive, but also um, don't limit yourself in terms of who your client base might be. The upper end is there. We put the emergency call button in. We thought there would be a turn off. And as Claire said, no, they wanted to see that. They said, that, that's what we're after. Um, they wanted a rating program. So with McCrindle, as we're going to show you later, we have developed a rating program by residents for the uh, internet because that is what they wanted. They do want a TripAdvisor to start services. And then they wanted lots of information. They read every word of the ad. If it was appropriate for them, they read every word. So we had lots of information in there. And, the, and uh, you know, 10 minutes after we finished uh, showing these ads, they could still recount points within the ads. And there was the map. Uh, the map was absolutely vital. It was embarrassing because we made up the map. Um, and you know, they were telling us all you know, where it was wrong and how it was out of this, that, and the other. And I thought, bugger, you know, we've got another two focus groups of being told <laughs> we've got it wrong. But, uh, so they really are into um, this level of detail. 
How does this translate? Uh, here is um, Angus Kakura is here from Arcadia. Arcadia um, have uh, incorporated many of these elements in their website. This is uh, their website from late last year. And um, it's an excellent website. I commend you to go and have a look at it. But you notice that right up front, this is a retirement, mostly lifestyle villages in their design and so on. But right up front, they say, in-home care services to future-proof your retirement. And they've got, you know, look at all the residents and so on they've got in that front page. And they feature lots and lots of video. Um, we're obviously a, a major proponent of um, video, but video works massively. The people in the uh, research loved the videos and they hung on every word and they could recount them back. And so here is a uh, resident testimonial from uh, WA. Uh, this was the, the most liked and you'd think it would be a turn off. Young marketing people would tell me that that's a turn off because she was discussing how her husband passed away soon after joining the village. But, uh, and it was grim, but in actual fact, it's a delightful story, and the and the uh, people in the uh, survey absolutely loved it. Um, and to give you an idea of uh, video, uh, some stats from our website for one week, um, we had uh, so we have 150 odd videos now on our website. Glengarry Village, of the people who know West Australia, is a small. 35-year-old village, uh, almost going into low care style. Um, in that week, 122 people download, or downloaded the video, i.e. they were exposed to it by their, their searching in that region, and 58 played it. It's a five minute long video. So 58 people in one week played this video uh, for Glengarry. Um, 275 saw the tall trees one, and 11 of them played it for a full five minutes. That's remarkable, you know, in a week you've got customers who take sufficient interest to watch a video for five minutes. So this is how uh, the generation is going forward. And remember, video works 24-7 on a tablet uh, in the kitchen. And also, um, if I can just point out, uh, the, the cohort is rapidly changing. Um, late last year we started putting vacancies up on our website, uh, and this has dramatically changed the behaviour of people on our website. All marketers would put uh, promotional listings on our website wanting to get links to, to your website. That's what we get judged as a publisher or a media group every day. As soon as we put the vacancies up, that changed all the behaviour. So um, you can see for Aveo Peninsula Gardens, which is here in Bayview, um, in the um, uh, month before, um, sorry, 2013, they had uh, four phone calls over a four month period uh, because people wanted to contact the village and they had 22 who clicked through to the website. A year later we put up the um, vacancies and it reversed. Uh, the number who went to the website was 11, the number that picked up the phone and called was 14 because they could see the vacancy, they could see the home and say, that is a home I can relate to, I'm interested, I'll pick up the phone and I'll bypass all this searching for the web because it's available now. So the cohort is dramatically changing. Um, we as a, a media group, to accommodate that, you've each been receiving your coffee in a yellow cup with a, a Frank and Ernest on it. Uh, Karen Curtis, my wonderful colleague here who's full of intelligent questions. And I have um, created a newsletter for residents of retirement villages. We have 180,000, 190,000 people who live in retirement villages across Australia. It's a community. They each have 190,000 friends. They each have 190,000 children. Um, they are a cohort that um, majority are having a wonderful time in villages, and some of them, uh, as we heard yesterday from Pamela, not so great. Uh, so we're going to launch a weekly newsletter, which is going to discuss the journey of ageing, planning for uh, retirement, what is occurring in uh, the aged care space in terms of RADs and DAPs and so on, uh, to engage that community and get the discussion going because we need them to talk to their friends if we're going to move the sector forward and get regulation changed and what have you. And for them to have a voice, I hasten to add, so that we're aware of what they want in product and what have you. And as I mentioned, um, we're all, as a result of the research, and uh, we've been working on this for 18 months, and we've tested over 300 villages now, the residents of over 300 villages, 
Uh, in May, we're going to launch a rating system for retirement villages as developed by the residents of retirement villages called ResiStar. Uh, and um, based on the, all the research we've done, developed by McCrindle and very well. So it's exciting times. Uh, the, uh, the reality is the resident, uh, prospective residents, if I can just uh, repeat one thing that Claire said was, nobody that we uh, had come into the focus groups wanted to woke up in the morning and say, I want to live in a retirement village. So nobody did that. And we have to understand that as the um, operators and marketers. What they did was they woke up in the morning and said, I need to do something and a retirement village is one of my options. And that is how we've got to position it. We have a solution. And what they were seeking was contentment, i.e. they wanted their problem taken away. So the care factor wasn't so important. They, they felt that if we move to a retirement village, I've, I've done something, that will solve my problem, I'm content again. So wonderful piece of research. So thank you, Claire. <laughs>